Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. This is now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. For by it, that is by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Amen. See, we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. You know, not walk according to the flesh, not walk according to our senses. And then he says, it's through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Hallelujah. So that the things which are seen were not made, things which do appear. God spoke it. God said it. It was not a visible, natural, tangible in the natural realm substance. It was a substance of God's faith that caused it to come to pass. Amen. He just spoke it and it happened. Amen. It obeyed his word. Now he said my word in Isaiah, my word does not go out of my mouth and not accomplish. My word shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish the thing whereunto I sent it. Think about that now. God said his word will do when he sent it to do. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. God's word is, has encapsulated within it what is necessary to bring it to pass when it is spoken. First Peter uh, chapter 1 refers to being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. God's word is his seed. And when it's planted, it will produce what it is. Now, to say it, say it quite simply this way, prosperity scriptures produce prosperity. Salvation scriptures produce salvation. Healing scriptures produce healing. Deliverance scriptures produce deliverance. That's what it, his word is full. In it is everything necessary for it to produce when it's planted. You can go to the store right now and buy you a bag of seed. Everything that that seed needs to become what it is is already in it, except it must be planted. When it's planted, it will, its own, and I'm not sure if this is the right term for, for seeds, but its own DNA, its own genetic makeup is designed that once it has germinated, it will begin to grow and to produce, ultimately produce what it is. If I plant tomato seed, I am not going to get collards unless they put a collard seed in my packet and it's still a collard seed. You're not going to get collards when you plant tomato seeds. And you're not going to get turnips if you plant corn seed. Amen. Everything produces. Remember, the law of Genesis, everything produces after its own kind. God made that command. Everything's to produce after its own kind. So we understand that God framed the world. Uh, the worlds were framed by his word. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts that by it, he yet being dead speaketh. I got that kind of turned around. That's okay. King Jimmy can get you turned around. All right. God testifying of his gifts that by it, he being dead yet speaketh. I think Yoda read the King James. It's a joke. Funny it is. By faith, Enoch was translated, translated, he should not see death, and was not found because he had translated him, God had translated him, for he, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. <coughs> but without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
For they that come, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. Now, I'm not going to try to ride, ride a bad horse or something here, but there's a statement made recently about that we don't worship God for God. We worship God for ourselves because it makes us happy, and we're happy God's happy. <clears throat> what pleases God is the diligent seeker of him. I seek after him. Mm -hmm. I don't seek after him for the sole purpose of making me feel better. See, that's not really worship. It is not worship if you go before the Lord and what you're doing is so you'll feel better. Now, I was, I'll tell you, there are benefits to worshiping God. But that's not why I worship God. I don't diligently seek God so I'll feel better. Amen? I desire to please him. And without living a life of faith, I can't please him. So I desire to please him. I desire to have his honor upon me. I desire for him to take pleasure in me. Because I'm pursuing after him. Amen? My desire is that he's honored. So when I enter into worship, when I obey God, when I do these things, I do it because I want to honor him and I want to please him. That's right. Amen. Amen. I don't do it so that I can walk away from there and say, well, I really did that. I did it for me. You know, I obey because I did it for me. I, I, I worship because I did it for me. Now he's happy because I'm happy. Yeah, that's, you know, like Bill Cosby said, they did that little video clip somebody put on one of those things. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Hallelujah. No. And like, you know, you, you, I read y'all my post last week. So, it's, you know, I'm not after anybody. I'm just saying we have to understand that pleasing God is a lifestyle for us. Honoring God is a lifestyle for us. Re having his pleasure on us because we desired to please him. We should be pleasers. Now, some of you parents, you know, you might have more than one child. When you, you can find out some, some children you have are not pleasers. And then you usually have a please. Usually every family has at least one pleaser, you know, and they just do everything they can to make you happy. And the others just don't care. And that's the ones you got to beat the, the don't care out of them. You know, sometimes you wonder if you're ever going to get it out of them. Keep after it. You'll get them. You'll get them through it eventually. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, some of them just you think, oh, Lord, <laughs> it's going to be a long road to hoe. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? The old country term. Long road to hoe. Get the hoe out. You got to go, go down that road and get all the weeds out and everything else. Keep it cleaned up so, you, so the crops will grow. And then he begins. He kind of leaves here after Abel and Enoch. And then he goes into the rest of this, this chapter of faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. By faith, Noah, when warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Now, another bozo came out recently, some Christian musician that won some Dove Award or something, him and his wife, said that the, the account of Noah was a myth, that you didn't have to believe it to be a Christian. You know, that there's no way scientifically possible he could put all those animals on there, you know, and all this kind of stuff. We serve the God. So he said, you know, his head just couldn't get around it because it was impossible. I serve the God, you know. So right here, he's calling the writer of Hebrews a liar. Now, I'm, I'm about fed up. I'm, now, listen, it's one thing to make a statement about a doctrine that you, you, know, you see, you know, we, we can deal with that. But just come out and call the Bible a lie. I'm tired of spending money on people who think they know better than everybody else, don't know their head from a hole in the ground. Just because they won some award, they got some song out there that everybody bought and that made them rich. That just makes them stupid with money. How dare you come out? You know, I just don't think it's possible. Well, you know what? Go sell your records to the world and stop selling them to the church. And Christians, stop buying them. Stop supporting them. Stop making them rich. Hello. 
If they're going to say stupid stuff. So all the young people that are, that are out there that are borderline that aren't really, don't really know their head from holy ground either, don't know anything about the Bible, listen to them. They're going, yeah, that's right. You can believe that. You know, you can still be a Christian and not believe the Bible. You better believe the Bible. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and you can't please God without faith. It just, it just ticks me off. And then nobody just, nobody calls them on the carpet. And, and, and you know, on that kind of thing, that needs to be called on the carpet. Who do you think you are to go out and say that you don't believe that the, the count of Noah is, is, a, is just, it's really a myth, it's not real, that you can be a Christian and not believe what the Bible says? Because Jesus, Jesus talked about Noah. If, he, if it was a myth, he should have said so. Mm -hmm. Here the writer of Hebrews accounts and grants authority to the account of Noah. It's not a myth. Just because it's impossible, just because your head can't figure out a miracle, tough. That's what the things of God are all about. We serve a supernatural God. We serve a God who's bigger than the natural. Are you here? We serve a God who can make a river go hither and thither. Probably don't believe that either. That's not scientifically possible for the Jordan River to go hither and thither. As a matter of fact, one place talks about how far it backed up each direction. Lo gives the location of how far it backed up. Flowing rivers don't back up. Not scientifically. You know? Probably don't believe he crossed over on the Red Sea. He went over on dry ground. He caused the Well, the water was only six inches deep in that. Come on, you, you drown a whole army of horses and all in six inches of water? By faith. So we've got to get back to believing that God's the God of miracles. God is a supernatural God. That he intervenes in the affairs of man. That God is able to do things that we can't get our head around. That you can't prove scientifically. Axe heads don't float. Is that another myth in the Bible? Fish and bread that have been cooked don't multiply. Is that another myth in the Bible? Come on now. You don't end up with more than you started out with. See, we are a people of faith. We are not a scientific, log uh, logical people. We are a supernatural people who believe in a supernatural God who can do supernatural things. Amen. The new birth is supernatural. Glory to God. Don't believe in healing. I mean, I mean, people getting healed. Cancers, legs growing out. New, uh, new, organ, new, new organs appearing. New limb, limbs appearing. That's all supernatural. Well, I don't believe in any of that because that's not scientifically provable. See, when you start with one place, you've got to go through the whole Bible and el eliminate every miracle and every supernatural event when you start saying, well, I just don't believe the account of Noah can be, could be really true. Well, then the account of the splitting of the Red Sea, the account of splitting the Jordan River every time a prophet showed up. That one didn't get split just once or twice. Every time a prophet showed up, it got split. I mean, the Jordan River had to be going, hey, what do you want me to do here? Every time one of your guys show up, I got to go a different direction. Come on now. <clears throat> I mean, you know, raising the dead. In the old, I mean, it happened all in the Old Testament. The prophet came and laid over the child and breathed, and he came to life. The young man was killed in battle, thrown into the tomb, Elijah's tomb, and came against his, Elijah's tomb, came against his bones, and got up, ran, ran out of the tomb. Can you imagine the guys that threw him in there, how fast they ran after that? I mean, they turn around, here he comes. Wow! Hallelujah. I mean, they had screams that James Brown never thought about. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> Amen. We're talking about the supernatural church with a supernatural God living by faith, believing that the God of miracles can do things that you can't get your natural carnal mind around. And if you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to know that he does those kind of things. Not only know it, believe, not, not have a knowledge, a gnosis, but the epinosis. You're going to have to have a hope, an expectancy. Glory to God. That right in smack dab in the middle of some circumstance of life, that the God of miracles is your God. And he can do things. Jesus walked on the water. See, now if you don't believe that, that Noah, the account of Noah was real, then you just can't believe that the account of Jesus walking on the water was real. 
because that's not scientifically possible. Yeah, and Peter too. Peter walked on the water to the guy's eyes. See, how did he walk on the water? Well, he didn't go, hey, Lord, I know you're walking on the water, but I don't believe that Noah's account in the Bible was real. Because that's, that's, that's not, you can't prove that with, the, with science. Yeah, I'm ragging this one out because I'm telling you that statement was one of the dumbest statements. Anybody, <clears throat> I expect it from the world. I do not expect it from people who are getting money out of the church, buying their records and getting awards. They got a place of prominence. Now they're the mouthpiece for the devil. They may not be a de de demon possessed, but they become a mouthpiece for the devil. Because there's a lot of people who listen to that and say, you know, yeah, you know, they, they got records. They sold money. They got a Dove Award. They're, they're rich. You know, people like their music. They must know something. People could be that stupid, you know. And then say that, you know, that, that Genesis account of Noah's floods is, is, a, is like a myth. Didn't really believe it happened. It's scientifically impossible. Since when are we limited to what a bunch of guys with PhDs say. Like Brother Hagin said, he finally figured out it meant post hole digger because a common post hole digger got more, can understand better than that. You know, people, you know, I'm not mocking education, but I'm telling you, when education comes cross grains to faith, it's got to go. It has to go. Well, I have intelligent faith. No, I have Bible faith. So people want to have intelligent faith. You can't have intelligent faith. Because it's not of the head, it's of the heart. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You believe something that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, you can't, you, you can't prove out in the natural. I believe I receive a healing now. You still look ugly. You look like death warmed over three times. But God's word's greater. Thank God for the word of God. Thank God we serve a miracle God. Oh, I don't have enough money to pay my bills, but thank God that he meets your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. There is a source, hallelujah, that you can tap into that you can't get into in the natural realm. Yeah, you go out and go out and work. You do what you're supposed to do. You're tired to do the things you're supposed to do. But you can come right up against the wall where there's no way out except God. And aren't you glad that when we, we get up against the wall where there's just God? We don't just got to go, oh, God. We can say, but God. I was in a place where I had no way out, but God. Will with the temptation make a means of escape. Hallelujah. That you will with the temptation may be able to bear it. Hallelujah. Oh, think about that, what we said this morning. Bear up under. Hupamino, get up under it. Hallelujah. Remain steadfast. Do the will of God. You will receive the reward. There's no chance to run. Y'all didn't do it. But by faith, I'm going to get off this now. By faith, Noah, <clears throat> being warned of things not as yet moved with fear, preparing art to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world, he became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Hallelujah. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the, Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city. See, here we are again, whose faith ha, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And it goes right back to what we were talking about this morning. Remember we talked about this morning how Paul kept pushing and kept talking, and the, and the New Testament keeps talking about getting our eyes on things of heaven. Abraham went and sojourned in a strange land looking for a city. He's look, he wasn't looking for where he was. He was looking for a different city who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Glory to God. I said glory to God. It's all right to have a nice house here. It's all right to have a nice car here. But I'm telling you, it pales in comparison to what God has in store for you. I mean, I mean we used to sing it all the time. See, now we, we made fun. And I was one of them that did it. You know, made fun of all the old church folk who, who sang songs about heaven. And we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Y'all remember that old song? I got a mansion just over the hilltop. And I don't remember. I have sung it so long, I don't remember how it goes. I remember that part. We used to think about, we used to talk a lot about heaven. Now listen, we need, we need 
to walk in this realm by faith and be aware of what's going on. But we need to get our eyes once again back up into the hope. Look for the city whose foundation and builder is God. Ha, ha, get some heavenly mind. Get, we need some heavenly mind. That's why. why. There's a blessed hope in that. Yes. We need to be rekindled with the hope. That, you know, the Bible says this. Paul said this in one place. He said this. If we in this life, on, if only in this life we have hope, we're among, the, among, among all men the most miserable. Our hope is not limited to a good life here. See, that's where power of positive thinking you know, and all these self-help motivational things all come up short because they're all designed to make you feel good while you're living here. But my hope is not limited. As a matter of fact, my hope doesn't even begin here. My hope is in God. My hope is in the future coming and the glorification of the body and being, that's where it starts. Let me say something else. Ends. It gets its start there and it finishes there. Yes, we're going to do things here. We're going to walk by faith. We're going to win. We're going to overcome. We're going to walk in health. We're going to walk in prosperity. We're going to walk in the blessings of God. But I'm telling you, if, if, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we're among all men most miserable. And I believe that's what... Uh, <clears throat> Praise God. All right. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to see if I can't. No, I got to go there. <laughs> I, was, wasn't, I was trying not to go there, but I got to go there. Back in the late 50s, you know, some of y'all remember uh, the healing revival in America was pretty well documented to have begun around 1947, ended in 1950, about 11 years. You know, you had all the healing evangelists. You had the, uh, m the magazine called uh, The Voice of Healing. That Gordon Lindsay published it, Christ for the Nations. Not Christ for All Nations, which is, you know, uh, Reinhard Bonnke, but Christ for the Nations Institute in Dallas. And Brother Lindsay was, was a Pentecostal pioneer. And, um, and then, then during the, vo the uh, great healing revival, he published a magazine called The Voice of Healing. And all, all the major healing evangelists, except Brother Roberts, published their meetings in that meeting, in that magazine. Brother Roberts had his own magazine, okay? Because he, you know, he had probably the largest healing ministry of anybody. His tent sat 20,000. Got a phone call one day, and somebody said, my tent's bigger than yours. I've just added on 2,000 people. That guy died early. So you can't get in pride even about the gifts of God in your life. Mm. Called him up in the middle of the night and said, my tent's bigger than yours. Well, see, it wasn't about having a bigger tent. You know, but, um, but right on the end of the healing revival uh, came <clears throat> what is referred to as the latter rain movement. And in that, in that revival that, that took place there, uh, there was a restoration uh, of the ministry gifts to the body of Christ. Now, up until that time in, the, in, the, in this, you know, and I know different seasons, but in, in this time in, in the church uh, existence, uh, most churches only recognize the pastor and the evangelist. There's only two gifts they recognize. Well, in the, in the latter reign, there became a restoration of the apostle and the prophet and the teacher along with the pastor and the evangelist. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a great move of God in, rec in recognition of those different gifts being in operation. But that, that move got short-circuited and killed. Now, back about 19... About 1999, 2000, somewhere in there. Now, and I, here I can, I can get the real date because if you go get the book, The Midas Touch, whenever it was published... That'll tell you, because the year, the year that uh, it was supposed to come out, Brother Hagen held off on publishing it because, of, because this thing called the Top Summit Meeting didn't go real good. There was a lot of conflict when he called in all the prosperity preachers. It's one of the most balanced books on prosperity you'll find. And people say, would Brother Hagen believe this? They'll go get your hand in the book and say, read this. So he called them all in. He said, look, you know, first, first day, first meeting, he, said, he, had, he had a stack of notebooks beside us where he was sitting in his chair. He said, all you guys out there aren't preaching anything new. As a matter of fact, it was all preached back in the 50s during the latter rain. He, patted, he said, I got the notes right here. You're not preaching anything new. He said, and they got into excess and it killed the move of God. And I'm telling you, 
the thing that we've gotten into in the prosperity message in the church now that has caused problems is people become self-centered. They've gotten their eyes off Jesus. They think their money is used to control churches. Their money so they can just go live lasciviously. Their money's, you know, all this money's coming in, da-da-da-da-da-da, and they forgot the real reason for prosperity so that we can establish God's covenant in the earth. Now, I know people preach, you know, that that covenant was so we could establish God's covenant of prosperity with individuals. I don't believe that's what it meant. And I don't, it probably wouldn't stand up or next to Jesus of the scripture either. God wants to establish his covenant. God, listen, I'm not, going, I'm not going the other way. I'm not going the other ditch. God wants you poor and don't want you to have anything. But when the focus gets off, when the mindset gets off, and that's where it is right now. So much of the church, it's, you know, and, and now we don't even have people believing for prosperity. It's it just everything's all about them. The worship service has to be about their likes of rock and roll and fog shows and light shows and whatever else. The message has to be relevant. I wish somebody would tell me what that means. Because all I can get out of most of it is it's watered down to make people happy. You want to know what's relevant? You're sick. Jesus is your healer. You want to know what's relevant? You're lost and without God. Jesus is your Savior. You want to know what's relevant? You know, you don't have any money. You're up at heart against our place. Jesus is your supplier. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What's relevant is that the Word of God is still true. Not some watered-down Mickey Mouse thing that makes you feel good. Amen. <clears throat> and so we have left the place. just getting it all on him. And I'm talking about as a general rule in the church now. And come to the place of what's in it for me? What can I do and not be committed? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. Amen. Are you here? You're going home. If we're going to live in the place of faith like these guys lived. We look at the, you see all this, but go look at what they did. They sold out. They sold out 100%. Elijah came by Elisha and threw something on him. He said, let me go back and, you know, and, you know, kiss my mom and dad and whatever. And, and he's like, what have I got to do with you, boy? We ain't got time for that mess. You don't have time to put your hand in the plow and look back. If we're going to have the, the, if we're going to have the kind of things here, we're going to have to sell out to the Lord. But boy, when you sell out to the Lord, that's a good place to be. I said, that's a good place to be. I mean, you can sell out to him, and I can tell you, he's not going to hurt you. He's not, he's not going to call your number and make you suffer. Hallelujah. Are you here? He looked for a city whose foundation and builder was God. Once again, church, let us look steadfastly into the gaze of his glory. By faith, that also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang even of one as him as good as dead. So many as the stars in the sky and multitude in the sand, which is by the seashore, innumerable. And I like this. These all died in faith, not having yet received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Now, think about this. These people were looking at it from behind the cross. They hadn't, the cross hadn't come yet. And the Bible says they received the promises, having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. There's, there's something we've gotten in trying to let people know that God has good things and blessings for them. We've gotten people over into a place of all they can think about is what's in it for me. And they have forgotten that they're to look to the Lord. They're to embrace the promises of God. They're to confess them. We are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The Word of God even says we're ambassadors for Christ, which means what? You don't have citizenship here. 
You're a sojourner in a strange land. Amen. But that's okay. I said, that's okay. See, we, we got people so, so pursuing this world's goods. And I mean, don't, don't take me wrong. I'm not one of, of the persuasion. I don't want this whole world's goods. Like Brother Hagin said one time, he said that for so long. That, and he said, hey, I won't get any of them either. <laughs> but now we got everybody trying to pursue the world's goods. That's all they're after. No. God wants to put the world's goods in your hands as a tool. It's okay to have a nice car. It's okay to have a nice house. okay to have things. But baby, if things have you, you're in trouble. Because what God wants is he wants your heart. He wants your passion. He didn't make you rich so you can control anybody. He didn't want you, you know, he didn't want you rich so you can just go do what you want to do. Okay? For that, listen here. They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly. Declare plainly that they seek a country. I think it's time that the church start walking like ambassadors than subservient citizens. I'm here on a mission. I'm not here to get caught up in the culture of the world. I'm here on a mission to save the world. I represent Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. See, we, we've gotten caught up with living like the world lives. And then go out and tell everybody, if you live like me, you can go to heaven. That's not ambassadorship. And mo you know what happens usually? In, in countries when their ambassadors get so caught up with the culture of the country and stop doing the job, they recall them. You don't want to get recalled. You want, to finish your, you want to finish your course. You want to finish what God has for you. Amen? Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Declare plainly they seek a country. And truly, have they been mindful? Remember we preached earlier this year. They've been mindful of the country from which they came out. They might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Oh, glory to God. Amen. He's prepared for us a city. Praise God. Amen. I said amen. amen. He's, look at this again. They that say such things, what? Well, let's see here. Where, where does it say it? Embrace them and, conf and they confess they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. And they that say such things declare plainly they're seeking a country. It is not about how much like the world can I be. It should be about how much like Jesus can I be. I'll win more people acting like the world. No, you won't. The world will win you. I said the world will win you. God is calling you. These people who live by faith did not want to be Tainted with the citizenship of the world. They were ambassadors. They wanted to represent their God. This is not to condemn you, but I'm telling you, we need to stop preaching stupid stuff and trying to convince people it's okay to live, live in the world system. When the Bible says, come out from among you and be you separate and touch not the unclean things, saith the Lord. That is not... So you can't have fun. It is so you can do your job. It is so you can serve the Lord and be his ambassador and win people to Jesus. Because what honors God and what pleases God beyond anything else is bringing people into the kingdom of God. And that's a walk of faith. I said, that's a walk of faith to do that. Can you just pray ye the Lord of the harvest? It has sent forth laborers into his harvest. The fields are white already into the harvest. And we're trying to play Mickey Mouse games. How much can I get away with? How much like the world can I be? Why do we want to be like the world? I got saved to get out of that mess. Yes, yes. But you know what? 
just like we preached earlier this year back in January, had they been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. You start desiring Egypt, you can get Egypt. And remember we said, Egypt just ain't all that. If you remember, you wanted to get out of there when you got out of there. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, and for he has prepared for them a city. Keep talking about that city. See, we got to get our eyes back up again. Now under the old covenant, it was I will look unto the eyes from whence cometh my salvation. Now as we look unto the, the city that is our ultimate destiny. Amen. By faith, when he was offered, tried, uh, offered, tried, offered up Isaac, then he was received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. We mean received him in a figure. By faith, he had received him raised up from the dead. Because God had given a promise. In Isaac shall your seed be. Isaac hadn't had any children. God said, go offer Isaac on the sacrifice. Abraham took him up there and said, you know, y'all stay here. I and the lad are going to go yonder and worship and we'll return again unto you. He knew God was going to raise him up out of the dead after he, after he slew him and burned him on that sacrifice. God would have to raise him from the dead. Because that was his promise. This was the seed. So even if it looks like your, your promise has been sacrificed and burnt on the altar, God's word is still true. Hallelujah. I said God's word is still true. Hallelujah. He'll just have to raise it up from the dead and put it back into manifestation. Amen. That's arrogant. No, that's Abraham. Yeah. And we're to, we're, we're to have the faith of our father Abraham. Can you say amen? amen? By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Don't leave my bones in this, in this heathen country. I don't even want him to die. I leave my bones here. Take them home. Amen. Glory to God. I said glory to God. See, we're not going to cast away our confidence. We're going to have great recompense and reward. And now he goes right out of that and starts talking about faith and then starts giving us examples of people. who had lots of opportunities to cast away their confidence. Joseph had dreams. Remember the dreams of Joseph? I mean, yeah, he got a little ahead of himself. Saw his brothers worshiping him. Twelve she's. One was his, one was the other eleven were his brothers, and they all bent over and bowed down and worshiped. And they got mad. Why? It was against the culture of that day for the younger to have authority over the others. But they all came and worshipped him later. They all had dreams. Every one of these people here had dreams from God. They had visions from God. They have assignments from God. Over and over and over again, they had the opportunity to cast off their confidence and to give up and to quit and to go and hide somewhere and they would have never read about them. We see those who came short but then got it back. We see those who maintained and stayed steady all the way through. Amen. Over and over again. And this was all for a promise that they knew they weren't even going to embrace in this and that part of their life. They were going to have to wait until it was manifest and he, Jesus came and preached to the captives of prison and led captivity captive. Glory to God. Rainbow Bible Training Center, uh, well, Rainbow Bible Church. Uh, the footprint of Rainbow Bible Church is about an acre. It's a pretty big church. If you've ever been there, it's, it, it's a hall to get around. And it's a hall, H-A-L-L. -L. I said it's a hall, H-A-U-L. But you do it through an H-A-L-L. -L. It's a long way around that bit, around the sanctuary and all the stuff downstairs. And then there's an upstairs. Not quite as big as the downstairs footprint, but it's pretty big. Acre footprint. Now, years ago, now, and, see, and, and see, Raymond Bible Training Center uh, started at, at Sheridan Road Assembly of God on Sheridan Road. Obviously, on Sheridan Road. And the Assemblies of God Church. And the church that Billy Joe Doherty actually ended up pastoring. And then, uh, then he went and started Victory uh, Church there in Tulsa. 
Uh, and, uh, but it was, it was the old Assemblies of God Church down there on, on Sheridan Road. And that's where Raymond started. That's where, that's where he was doing the camp meeting. Brother Hagin was doing camp meetings in that church. And that's when he spoke and said, you know, we're going to start a Bible school. And they opened up Rainbow Bible Training Center after a, a, year, a year or two. They went out there to Broken Arrow, where they are right now. And there was, a, there was an office building and a warehouse. And as soon as they drove on land, the Lord spoke. And Dad said, this is it. This is it. And they bought that and, and started, you know, remodeled the warehouse until the school. And that became the school. And then since then, it's been building and building and building ever since. But years, that, that land was owned by a, a family uh, back in the early 1900s. About 1920, 1930. And it was farmland. You've got, when Raymond went, to, went out to Broken Arrow, it was a podunk cow town. I mean, they still wore the spurs and, and boots and stuff. I think they may have rode the horses into town. I mean, it was just a little bitty po When I got there, it wasn't much better. I mean, it was just, it was just a little, it was a little podunk uh, cow town. And that's all it was. Tulsa was the bigger town, but, you know, between Broken Down and Tulsa, you go out in the country, I mean, you went out the two-lane roads that they just throw, they threw asphalt down on dirt roads. <laughs> skunks, every morning you could sing, I was a dead skunk in the middle of the road. Because there was. Get into your car, oh, Lord Jesus. Just the odor would get into your car, man. I mean, you're talking about first thing in the morning, that just turned your stomach. Y'all know, anybody know what I'm talking about? That's a nasty smell. But out there on that land, they, they started doing some research later. And, and the, the, uh, the, the patriarch that, that owned that land, the dad, I guess the grandfather of the kids or great-grandfather of the kids when they started talking to him, there was a knoll. Now, you got to understand, in Oklahoma, a knoll is anything over an anthill. Okay? There's a little knoll out there on the property, and then he would go out there and pray and pray that God would use and reach the nations from this property, this land. And so they started doing some research, talking to the family and talking to different ones. And, and, and finally, they finally figured out uh, they're pretty sure, you know, you're talking to people, you know, well, yeah, it's over here. The, where Raymond Bible Church sits right now is where that was. That man's been dead for years, since like the early 70s. Church wasn't built until 1992 or three or something like that. He died in faith, having not yet received the promise. But it came to pass. See, we get so caught up with, I didn't get my $100 blessing this week. Now, I know we need finances. We need to believe God. You know, tell the devil, take his hands off your money. Send your angels out, ministering spirits. Go bring my money in in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We, we, got, we got to have money to operate and, so, and we can use, use our faith. But I am telling you, we can't be living and serving for money. We got to get our eyes on eternal things. That go beyond, money. Yeah, we, that's, it takes money to run this church. We need miracles and finances in the church. We need lots of money. Keep sending out your, your keep sharing and keep re, repeat sharing the uh, GoFundMe thing now. Don't let it just drop off the map. It'll, it'll drop off because it's not being seen. Mm -hmm. Somebody might see it this week. You didn't see it last week. Well, somebody might write and say, I don't want to see that no more. Well, you know, praise the Lord. We'll, we'll block you off of sending it to you. Amen. But send it. Keep it out there. Amen. We need, we need the finances in the church to do the will of God. But we can't be money, so money-minded that we lose sight of why we're here. Amen. Can somebody say glory? glory. We're here to be an ambassador for Christ. We're here to honor the Lord. We're here to cause the goodness of God to be made manifest in the earth and to help people come to Jesus. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.